I don't think I can overstate the importance Halo has had throughout its time. One of my earliest videos on this channel was called Halo's Live Action Legacy, diving into Halo's use of live action commercials, especially during the marketing for Halo 3, and how that influenced not only the advertising of future titles, but games as a whole. At the time, I noted that Halo certainly hadn't been the first, but their approach was a game changer, pun intended. Halo's live action commercials didn't simply advertise the game, they told a story, something directly connected to the product being advertised, sometimes only tangentially related, but it was something different and something new. And that's not too much of a surprise, as Halo is known for changing the gaming landscape, at least here in the West, if not worldwide. I don't need to recount what Halo CE and Halo 2 did for shooters and online gaming, and Halo 3 was a record-setting game, no small feat for a game that was a console exclusive. And I've of course spent a lot of time on this channel praising Halo's book catalog. However, there's one other medium that I certainly have touched on, though perhaps not in as much detail as it deserves, and that is comics. Recently, Dark Horse announced that the first Halo comic, the Halo graphic novel, would be reprinted for the first time in years, making this anthology widely available to fans once again, and I couldn't be happier. The Halo graphic novel was a one-of-a-kind book that left an impact on the industry and set a standard for anything to follow. And so today, I'd like to talk about the impact and why this graphic novel is so important. We'll touch on the stories being told for sure, but this won't be a look at the lore directly. I may do that someday, but for now, let's look at the importance of the Halo graphic novel. The turmoil of Halo's early years are fairly well documented these days. Halo CE was basically finished at the 11th hour thanks in no small part to the efforts of Eric Trotman. Trotman, along with Matt Soul, for which the Soul system that contains the titular Halo was named, and Brian Boren, for which Boren Syndrome may or may not have been named, agreed to help finish the script for Halo CE in exchange for Bungie's sign-off on Halo The Fall of Reach. Bungie has never been a fan of others messing around in their universe, and that attitude remains strong to this day. There's a reason why you don't see a lot of Destiny transmedia projects, not that this is a judgement or anything. Anyway, following the explosive success of Halo CE and The Fall of Reach reaching bestseller status, it wasn't long before Microsoft's franchise development team began looking at ways to continue to expand the franchise. Eric Trotman once again came to the table, presenting a comic draft written by John Nee Ryber, a solid writer of military fiction, according to Trotman, and illustrated by Addie Granov, who would go on to help design the Iron Man suit for Jon Favreau's film, among other notable works. The plan at the time, roughly early 2004, was for a monthly comic not unlike the eventual Halo escalation from the sound of things. However, art director Lorraine McLeese found the pitch to be, quote, a lump of coal. Bungie wanted more direct control over the project and, more specifically, to be able to select the artists and writers that they would work with. According to Eric Trotman, that included the legendary Joe Kubert and Alan Moore, a pipe dream to say the least. The project was ultimately shelved by the franchise team, but McLeese proposed Bungie essentially put something together themselves and then pitch it to a publisher. They obviously never scored Kubert or Moore, Kubert way too busy with his own work and Moore having long since sworn off mainstream comics, but they did find luck with Maria Cabardo, thanks to Robert McLeese having worked with her years prior. While not a familiar name to the public, Cabardo had and continues to work within the comics industry, and she opened doors to numerous individuals for Bungie. Reportedly, Cabardo was sold when Lorraine McLeese expressed that their only goal was to make something cool, to do things right and avoid forcing some arbitrary deadline. There were early talks of hitting Comic-Con in San Diego the year that talks with Cabardo began, four months away according to Lorraine McLeese's recollection. A list of writers and artists was put together, a budget was established, and the team went to work. The proposal for the Halo graphic novel was to make something cool. Bungie wanted to work with artists and writers they chose, while also allowing those creators to express their own voices. This was a naturally attractive prospect. To quote artist Simon Bisley, the stress was to make these characters look very much as they do in-game, 
Beyond that point, I was given free reign to interpret the script and the action. After four story proposals were settled on, Bungie and Maria began pairing up these stories with artists. The first was Last Voyage of the Infinite Secure, written by Lee Hammock and illustrated by Simon Bisley. Lee Hammock had written for comics, trading cards, and role-playing games, and was, at the time, a video game designer, a perfect choice given the variety of his work. Simon Bisley is known as one of the best action storytellers in comics, with a variety of action-packed stories under his belt including Batman, Lobo, Judge Dredd, and more. The Last Voyage of the Infinite Secor told the backstory of the Spec Ops Commander from Halo 2, the Halfjaw, Urtas Vadumi. Incidentally, I think this book was the first time he was publicly named, but don't quote me on that. I looked through a ton of Halo 2 peripheral material, short of the game guides, and couldn't find it listed anywhere, but for all I know it could have been listed on the back of some Joyride toy some years ago. But back on topic, this comic is set during the events of Halo CE, starting just as the Master Chief touches down in the swamps of Alpha Halo. Some flood repair a spirit dropship and invade the agricultural ship Infinite Secor. When a distress call is received by the fleet, the Supreme Commander and future Arbiter Thel Vadimi, unnamed in the comic, dispatches Urtas to investigate. Over the course of the story, we learn how Urtas lost his two mandibles and why he knows what the Flood smells like. What is it? That stench. I've smelled it before. Last Voyage is by far the longest story in the collection, making up more than a third of the graphic novel's 128 pages. The second story was Armor Testing, an attempt to give a bit more lore on the Chief's Mjolnir armor, showing that it wasn't just handed to him all willy-nilly. Reportedly, by the initial meeting for the creation of the graphic novel, several involved staff had just read Skunk Works, a memoir by Ben R. Rich about his time working with secret projects for Lockheed, which seems to have loosely inspired armor testing. Jay Farber, I hope I didn't butcher that, known for his work on comics like Generation X and the Titans with DC, along with some work for Image Comics, was the chosen writer for the story, excited to write a comic based on a video game as, in his own words, the two mediums complement each other perfectly. The art here was a team effort, with Andrew Robinson providing the inks and color, and Ed Lee editing the work digitally, giving it, quote, a new intensity. Armor testing is basically what it says on the tin, with Mjolnir armor that would be received by John 117, the Master Chief, at the start of Halo 2, being tested by, of all people, a retired Spartan 2 named Maria 062. I'd bet money she was named after Maria Cabardo. This comic introduces one of the largest oddities in Halo lore, and a character that many want to see more of to this day. The third story is much simpler by comparison to anything else in the book, though don't take that to mean that it's somehow lesser. Breaking Quarantine tells the story of Sergeant Avery Jr. Johnson's escape from the flood containment facility on Alpha Halo. It's told entirely through visuals, having no dialogue at all. Breaking Quarantine was an attempt by Bungie to, quote, carve into stone certain events from the extended universe that deviated from our original vision of the story. That is to say, this was meant as a retcon of the idea that Johnson was immune to the flood. Whether it succeeded on that front is another debate, but where it absolutely succeeded was visualizing Johnson's harrowing escape, and that was thanks to the chosen artist, mangaka Tsutomu Nihei. I hope I got that right. A Japanese manga artist, Nihei is probably best known for his first original work, Blame, along with Biomega, a later series. Both are stellar stories if anyone is looking for some new reading material. Self-described as Japan's most hardcore Halo fan, Nihei was excited for the project and nervous. This was the first time he'd drawn based on someone else's script, never mind that the scenery was already established. In some ways, Nihei is actually underutilized in the Halo graphic novel, specifically when it comes to the, by comparison to his usual work, simple backgrounds of the time. However, having the man behind Blame and Biomega draw the Flood was an absolutely brilliant idea, as the Flood had never looked as terrifying, and arguably never have since. And that's not a dig at any other artists, that's just high praise for Nihei. The final story is Second Sunrise over New Mombasa. Set in the titular city just before the events of Halo 2, the story follows a then-unnamed Oni propaganda producer on a day in his life, before everything goes to hell as the Covenant invades Earth. It was one of our first looks at civilian life in the Halo universe, offering a unique perspective on how the war effort is perceived and how disconnected Earth is from the genocide happening around them. 
The story was written by Brett Lewis, a man who had very little video game experience at the time, but dove headlong into the Halo universe, reading through the available published material of the day and listening to the soundtracks. Finding Halo 2's new Mombasa theme to be his favorite, his story proposal was of course set within the Earth City. According to the comic's creator notes, the proposal almost made Lorraine McLeese want to cry, leading Bungie to pair Mr. Lewis with the legendary French artist Jean Giraud, better known as Mobius. Mobius has a stellar art style, mixing crazy designs with bright and bold colors, resulting in scenes that can look incredibly busy from a glance, but with details that somehow nonetheless pop out and are clear and distinct. Second Sunrise is often one of the lowest regarded stories within the collection for its incredibly different art compared to the other stories, but for me, this is one of the reasons it remains my absolute favorite. The main character of the story would go on to reappear in Halo 5's marketing Hunt the Truth, now named Ben Giro, his last name a tribute to the artist who first brought the photographer to life. And bookending the anthology would be a gallery of art from various artists, both from the larger industry and from within Bungie. With the project underway, scripts written and art being made, Bungie began to shop the idea around to publishers. Ultimately, Marvel was chosen, having sent the most enthusiastic proposal with a robust release plan, aided by an underlying love of the franchise. Publicly announced on May 17, 2006, the Halo graphic novel generated immediate buzz within the Halo community and comics industry. Historically, video game comics hadn't been taken all that seriously and weren't often held in regard, not unlike the attitude that still pervades movie tie-in video games. On July 19, 2006, that would change. The Halo graphic novel released to generally high praise and arrived at number two on both the Bookscan and Diamond sales charts. The graphic novel would continue to be a top seller for months after its release. Most reviewers praised the wealth of contributions to the book, both in the main story and the bonus gallery at the end. A few reviewers expressed disappointment at the focus on minor characters and events, but these were seen as a minority opinion, many places lauding the decision to focus on other aspects of the Halo universe. And that's to say nothing of the impact the graphic novel would have on the Halo lore community, both at the time and even now. When writing this script, I decided to hold a small poll on Twitter to see what people's favorite stories were and how they discovered the graphic novel, and I certainly got a wide range of answers. In terms of popularity, it was no surprise The Last Voyage of the Infinite Secure took the top spot, followed by Breaking Quarantine, then Armor Testing, and finally Second Sunrise. I love focuses on different and new characters, but one cannot deny that stories with known characters tend to do better. The success of the graphic novel would lead to a fairly fruitful partnership between Bungie and Marvel for years, and I think it can safely be credited with giving video game comics more credibility among readers and within the industry. As has been the case for Halo before, they didn't do it first, but they did it in a way that changed perceptions and left their impact. Nothing like the Halo graphic novel has been produced since 2006, but the comics set a quality bar that any subsequent project would have to live up to. The disappointment with early Dark Horse comics, Initiation and Escalation, was only amplified due to the standards previously set, and thankfully, Halo comics have since returned to those higher standards they once sported. The Halo graphic novel was a game changer, but even the most popular media eventually fall out of circulation, and this was no exception. Finding copies became harder and harder, and by the early 2010s, copies were pretty much only available through aftermarket sellers. It's an unfortunate reality that most popular stories become more difficult to access over time, and that's especially unfortunate for the Halo graphic novel. The stories it told were a peek at moments surrounding the games that existed at the time, a show of what else was happening while the Master Chief was cutting through alien forces. From backstory on fan-favorite characters to slices behind the scenes of the Halo universe, in more ways than fans might have expected. And more than that, it opened new doors for storytelling. The impact of the Halo graphic novel cannot be understated, or at least, I don't think it can. And now it's being reprinted, a new generation of Halo fans finally able to experience it for the first time, 
or re-experience it in some cases. They'll be able to discover the deeper connections between the Arbiter and Spec Ops Commander, the true badassery of Sergeant Johnson, the capabilities of a Spartan, the origins of Ben Jiro, and a plethora of additional art to immerse themselves in. The graphic novel was something special, and I cannot wait to see how people react to it a second time around. As we wrap up this video, I'd like to know from those who have read the graphic novel, what was your favorite story and why? And for those who haven't read it yet, are you planning to grab a copy when it releases this fall? Let me know in the comments below. When it does release, I think it'll be a good time to do another flashback review, focusing on the lore the book set up, both in its core stories and beyond. So look forward to that later this year. For now though, this has been Halo Cannon, and I'll see y'all next time. First, I'd like to give a big thank you to our Horispus patron, Hope. Hope is the very first Horispus, so an extra special thank you on top of that. Next, I'd like to thank our theoretical patrons. If you'd like to see your name here or get a direct shout out, check out patreon.com slash halocanon. You can simply support the channel or get additional benefits, such as behind the scenes material and shout outs like this. However, your continued viewership is more than enough for me. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a thumbs up and maybe even subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. If you really enjoy this, turn on that notification bell so you can be among the first to see new videos when they release. But for all my fellow Canaanites, keep on being awesome.